It's a beautiful sunny day. And wherever you are in the world, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. It's been a great week. We've had a storyteller from Finland, a storyteller from Italy, several from America, and of course, around the British Isles. And next week, we have tellers from South America, from England, from Wales, and from Scotland. How fantastic is this? But right now I'm thinking of my own travels. And right from when I was very, very small, I was brought up on tales of Vancouver Island. My, my grandfather had been sent there because he upset his family. And when my father was 15, he went out to join him and he, he traveled by boat across where he had his money stolen by the purser and he had a train ticket. So he, he took that long train journey from one side of Canada to the other. He was fed by nuns. When he got there, he worked with his father on farms and fishing. And, uh, and they ran rum down to the United States during Prohibition. And I was brought up on all these stories. And then, towards the end of his life, my grandfather came back and was looked after by my parents, came back to this country, and he told me more stories. Um, I'd always wanted to visit. My brother, when he was 20 years old, had gone out and settled there. So, I was about 70, 69, 70, and my partner said, uh, you've always been talking about it, we're gonna go. And I went there for the first time in my life, and it was beautiful. And, and this story comes from there, I could not, possibly have told it till I'd been there because some way you kind of need to get a picture in your mind's eye before you tell a story and it's a First Nation story from uh, and it's about deer and wolf now, Wolf in those days controlled the tide. And Wolf decided, and I don't know whether it was for devilment or what, but he decided that it would be high tide all the time. Well, the people of that area ate by collecting mussels and collecting clams. And for that, they needed low tide. They needed to walk out when the tide was low. And so, because they couldn't get any food, they got hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And deer turned round to the people, for in those days, animals and people could talk to each other. I know there's some people who have the gift now, but not many of them. And deer said, look, wolf must be getting hungry too. So, build a wooden box big enough to put me in and give me your sharpest muscle knife to have, that I can have inside the box. box. Make sure you leave the lid open just a little so I can breathe. And then carry that box to the edge of the clearing and leave the box there and start going wailing around the village. Deer is dead. Deer is dead. And that's exactly what they did. And of course, word that deer was dead spread and spread and it spread to wolf's ears. And wolf thought, I'm a bit hungry. If deer is dead, maybe there's a meal there. And, uh, and he went and he found the box. <laughs> It smelt of deer. That's going to be a good meal, thinks Wolf. And in those days, Wolf used their tails 
to leave the things open and he stuck his tail inside through that crack in the lid where that lid was slightly open and he put his tail inside and he began to push with his haunches and push and push and push the lid and deer got that muscle knife cut off the wolf's tail wolf went screaming back and deer took the tail to the middle of the village and hung it over the fire Well, pretty soon, Wolf's brother came and asked for his tail back. And uh, they said, well, you can have the tail back if you let the tide go out. Wolf's brother took, uh, took the message back to the biggest wolf, the chief wolf, leader of the pack. And told him, and Wolf sent a message back saying, well, I'll let the tide go out enough so you can collect your muscles. So, dear, put the tail a little closer to the fire and it started singeing. That's not enough. We need to get our clams as well. Well, when Wolf got the message, he sent the message back. It could go out for one day and you can collect all the clams you want. Well, they put the fire... The, the, Deer put, took the tail and put it a little closer to the fire and it was really singeing and going black and, 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 and soot covered by now. And he said, no, we need the tail to go out every day. We need to eat every day. And that message was taken back to Wolf and Wolf sent a message back that he would, in fact, allow the tail to go out twice a day. So every six hours. Tide changes. And Wolf knows if ever he mucks about with the tide again, he might well lose his tail. And not only that, his whole pack might lose their tails. And from that day on, the tide has gone in and out twice a day. And it was a fantastic journey around that island. I'd never seen anywhere so beautiful in all my life. Cathedral Grove, where, where there were primeval trees and primeval forests. I'd, I'd never seen a primeval rainforest before. It was fantastic. But some of the earliest journeys I made were to Ireland. And it was back in the 60s. And I think driving licenses had only existed for a year. And, there was still a lot of donkey carts around on the, on the roads. And I had a fantastic time. Hitch right round Wickford, down around the Ring of Kerry, up through Galway. There was Sligo. I remember just walking down a, a tiny little country road in Sligo and someone came and called me over and uh, he wanted me to catch his mare. It had a year, it had a foal the year before, and it hadn't been used. And he needed to. You could see, you could see the, the clouds coming and a storm coming over the lake. And he needed to get his hay in before that storm. And he, he drove, and we ran, we chased that mare around, and he stuck me between two bushes, and he drove the mare towards me, and he said, "Don't worry, it'll turn before it gets to you." And of course. As a young man, you're more worried about losing face than being rung down by a horse. So, uh, and he was right. It did turn just before it got to me, but I could feel the breath of that mare on my face. It was that close. And of course, once we caught it, once we caught her, she just worked beautifully and the little yearling trotted along beside her. And when we finished, I was taken into his cottage. And I was expecting, he said, would I like some food? And I was expecting farmhouse fare. And there it was, it was, I mean, I'd never seen such poverty. The, 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 the fireplace had everything. It looked like a scene from Van Gogh's Potato Eaters. And, uh, and he came out with six slices of bread and margarine. But, 
That's just by the by. But I, I, it's where I, it's, it's one of the things that started me storytelling because I'd got a lift back from Donegal and I was go, go, going through Donegal and they were singing songs and, uh, and they asked me to sing a song and there was a mother and a son and they were singing songs and telling stories. And uh, they said, now, now sing us a song or tell us a story. And I'd never felt so English in my life. I had neither in my head. So from that day on, I was determined that that would never happen again. And as my voice is really bad, I did put, my singing voice that is, I did put a few stories in my head. This was a second story, uh, a favorite story of my second child. And when we go to storytelling, when he was small and we go off to uh, where I'd be storytelling, I'd tell him stories on the way. And, uh, and this is one, it's a, a, a story from uh, County Wicklow collected by, uh, by Kennedy, the Dublin bookseller. Uh, and it's, there was a wi widow. And she was very, very poor, but when she was widowed, she was with child. And when that child was born, she had no clothes to put him in. So every night she would take ashes from the fire and she'd make a hole in those ashes. And Tom, for that was the babe's name, would be put in the middle of that hole. And as, as Tom grew, so that pile of ashes grew. And eventually, I don't know where she got it from, but the widow got Tom a goatskin. Now, Tom was really proud. He'd walk down the street in his goatskin, and he, I mean, he didn't care how much fun people made, out, made of him. He had a goatskin, and he was free to walk around. Well, one day, his mother said, look, Tom, you're 19 years old. You've been pretty useless. You've not done anything. Could you at least do something? You're a big, strong lad. Could you go to the forest and bring me a bundle of twigs for the fire? Some kindling. Well, if he went for the forest, and he was cutting the kindling, when out came a huge giant, nine feet tall, with one head, and he had a club on his shoulder. And he waved, a club, uh, waved the club at, at Tom and said, what are you doing in my forest? What are you doing taking my wood? And Tom picked up a dead tree, for he was that strong, and knocked the giant down and held the dead tree over him. And said, I don't know if you prayed before, but you'd better pray now if you're about to lose your life. Well, giant said, spare me, spare me, spare me. But, but, uh, 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 take this club. If you are without sin, you can never lose a battle with it. Well, Tom said, well, thank you very much. And he took the, the club and he took the, the sticks and he went back to his mother. But soon those sticks were burnt and he was sent back to the forest again. And this time it's a giant 12 feet tall and the giant has two heads. And he faces Tom and said, what are you doing in my forest? And Tom said, uh, picked up another tree and knocked the giant down and then took his club and held it over him and said, I don't know if you prayed before, but you better pray now for you're about to lose your life. Spare me, spare me, spare me, said the giant. I have this whistle and if you're without sin, if you blow this whistle, whoever is listening cannot help but dance. Thank you very much, said Tom. And off he went. Well, he went back for a third time, and this time it's a giant 15 feet tall with three heads. And just like before, he asked Tom what he was doing in his forest, and just like before, Tom knocked him down, held the club over him, and said, I don't know if you pray, ever prayed before, but you're about to lose your life. Spare me, spare me, spare me, said the giant. I have this ointment, and if you're without sin, if you spread this, joint on, this ointment on you, you cannot be burnt and you cannot be cut. Thank you very much, said Jack. Well, Jack's walking around the village and he's got his club in his shoulder and he's got his whistle tucked. 
tucked under the other arm and he has his ointment in his little pocket. And he didn't mind if people laughed at him because he knew what he had. And he was happy. But a bugler came into the village. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The king's daughter has not laughed for seven years. And whoever can make her laugh three times can have a hand in marriage. That'll be a job for me, thinks Tom. And off he goes. Well, Tom's a strange looking fella and he's got a long curly black hair, curly black beard, dressed in a goat skin and he gets the gates of Dublin itself. And the guards say, what do you want? He said, well, I've, I've come to make the king's daughter laugh. And they laugh at him and they start pushing him around. And, you know, and one takes a, takes, a, takes a bayonet and sticks it in his side. And, well, that, that upset him a little bit. So Tom picked him up and threw him in the liffy. And uh, which is a river. And so, uh, well, they all set upon him then, and Tom took, took his took his club, and he knocked each of them in the river, and uh, he did. They weren't hurt. They were just spluttering and spitting out water, and all climbed out. And Tom went in, and there, in the square just outside the palace, you've never seen such. There were jugglers, and there were wrestlers, and there were people telling jokes, and there were people telling stories, and they were all trying to make the princess laugh. And uh, in walked Tom, strange as he looked. And there was a twinkle went in the princess's eyes. And there was a red-headed man, a steward, one of the king's stewards. And he really wanted the princess for himself. And he looked at the princess's eyes and he thought, I'm in a little trouble here. So he set everybody upon Tom. I mean, the wrestlers and, and the guards and everyone set upon Tom and he got his club and he knock, 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 knock until there was a big pile in the middle of the courtyard. Well, he hadn't killed anyone and he hadn't really hurt them. And the princess thought she'd never seen anything so funny in all her life. And first of all, she just gave a little smirk and then a giggle and then a great guffaw. When the king was so pleased, he invited Tom in, and the red-headed man is even more, even more upset. But Tom thought, well, I mean, obviously, to sit at the king's table, he couldn't be in his goatskin, so they gave him a fine clothes, and they gave him a wash, and he had a bit of a shave. And uh, he was a good-looking boy. And the princess was, uh, you know, well, she never stopped smiling through the whole dinner. She didn't laugh. Ah, uh, and Tom looked at the king and said, I've got a third of your, of your daughter now. I need to make her laugh another twice. And with that, the red-headed man thinking, well, there's a wolf comes in. We've got a lot of wolves today, haven't we? There's a wolf comes into Dublin every night. And it drags off one of our people. Could you go out and face the wolf and send it away so it never comes back again. Well, the princess wasn't too happy about that because she, you know, she liked Tom and she, she didn't want him eaten by a wolf. But, uh, well, but, wolf, but Tom said, I'll try, I'll try, it's not a problem. And the next day the wolf came in to the, to the city and it went right up to the courtyard and walked. Tom took out his whistle and started playing. And, uh, well, the wolf started dancing and anyone who hadn't managed to get inside their doors started dancing as well. And everyone was dancing and, and I mean, the red-headed man was dancing himself because he wanted to see uh, Tom eaten by the wolf and all he could do and the do wolf danced and the red-headed man danced and danced and then eventually the red-headed man uh, fell down. It was just his legs were still kicking in the air and the wolf collapsed. Um, Tom looked at the wolf and said, go away. 
and I never want to see you in the city again. And the wolf slunk out with its tail between its legs. And the princess laughed and she laughed and she laughed. And Tom said, that's two thirds of your daughter I've got. Well, that night, the red-headed man was even more upset. And he turned to Tom, he said, uh, he said, every year the Danes come and raid the city. And the only thing that will drive them away is a flail that hangs on the wall of hell itself. It belongs to the devil. Will you get it for us? Well, the princess was even more unhappy because she didn't want Tom going down there and not coming back. But next morning off Tom set and he walked for a long way and he walked through all those bad parts of the city where all sorts of people are getting up to all sorts of very unmentionable things. And he gets eventually to the gates of hell itself. And, uh, but on its way he spread that ointment on him. So when he's let in, the devil, the devil turns around and said, and what are you here for? He said, I've come to that flail that's hanging on that wall. You can have it, said the devil. And he turns to the imps and he said, well, would, you, would you bring the flail down for us? And they, they took the flail and they gave it to Tom and they were expecting him to burn his hands and, and be stuck there forever. And, 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 and they'd, they'd chained up the gate so he couldn't get in, but he just took it. And, oh, thank you very much. And now if you'll kindly let me out. You'll never get out again, said the devil. And he turned to the imps, he said, made sure he doesn't leave. Well, he took the flail and he beat the imps and he beat the devil himself. And in the end, he was saying, get out, get out, and I never want to see you again. Well, Tom went back and he lay that flail down on a stone just outside the palace. And the red-headed man decided that really he wanted it. And he went to pick it up and, oh, ooh, ah, he burnt his hands and, oh, oh, Tom, he was a kindly fella and he went out. He went with the ointment and he rubbed it in the red-headed fella's hands and, oh, he was smooth. He was actually quite grateful, but, oh, the princess just thought, you know, she had never seen anything as funny and she laughed for the third time. That's all of your daughter I've got, said, Ken, said, uh, said Tom. Well, as for the flail, that was so hot it burnt a hole in the st stone it was sitting on. But when the Danes heard that that was sitting in Dublin and they and Tom had the flail, they never raided Dublin again. And as for the princess and Tom, of course there was a great wedding, and of course there was massive sweet, and of course there was even more to drink, and of course had you been there, each and every one of you would have been invited. Well, recently, a few years ago, I, uh, I, went to, uh, I went to Romania, to Transylvania. What had happened, um, my sister was married to a guy who was the ex-bodybuilding champion of Romania, and he kept telling me how beautiful his area was. He kept showing me pictures of the area around Kolibitsa, which is a lake in the mountains. And then, a few years ago, I decided I'd buy a place there. I'd just go out and look. And so, and his brother found me a place that was up right up near the lake. It was beautiful. And I went out there for the first time about four or five years ago. And I like to get out there as much as I can. Of course, I can't at the moment. Lockdowns happen in both countries. Well, I shall be back as soon as I can. But this is a story from Transylvania. And we've had a bit about the devil today. And this is, actually, this is, uh, the devil comes into this one, or at least his grandmother. Because uh, there were two neighbours, Joska and Miha. 
Now Mihai was rich, had a farm, but he was me. And Yoshko, we had nothing. He lived in a little cottage in Mihai's land. And he he didn't pay rent, he worked for Mihai, but that's all he did. He rarely got he didn't get any wages. He'd get his lunch. And if he was really lucky, he'd suffer. And this particular day, he, they'd been shearing sheep, and that's really hard work. And if you see the size of those flocks on the, in Transylvania, they are huge. I mean, you, you, a flock comes down the road towards you, you're sitting there for a quarter of an hour uh, waiting for it to pass by. And there's about eight dogs driving them and, uh, and six shepherds. And uh, so after a day's shearing, he was exhausted and he was hungry. And he asked Mihai for, some, for, for a little food. And Mihai said, well, I, you had bread and cheese earlier. He said, but that was my lunch. He said, I'm, I'm really hungry now. All right, so Mihai, and he went to a string of sausages and he cut one sausage off. He gave it to him. He said, well, that, that'll do for me supper, but have you, could I possibly have another one for me breakfast? I'll work really well tomorrow if, I, if I've had some breakfast. Well, Mihai cut off another sausage and gave it to him. And as he gave it to him, he said, take that and go to the devil with it. Well, Mihai went home to his little cottage and he cooked one of the sausages and ate that for his supper. It wasn't much. But the next morning he woke up and he was still hungry. He thought, well, and he took, he took that and uh, sausage and he thought, oh, I'm supposed to take this little devil. And he, well, it took him actually longer than that. It takes a long time to walk to hell. And he got to the gates and, and there, there was the devil's grandmother. And she said, what have you come? He said, I've actually come to a to give this sausage to, 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 to the devil. She said, well, actually, all the devils actually are out collecting wood because, you know, it takes a lot of wood to stoke up those fires to keep burning those souls. But, uh, come in, come in. She said, well, actually, I don't care for sausages myself, and my grandson cares for me even less, but you look a hungry fella, he said, she said, so... I'll cook the sausage, cook that sausage on the fire, and I'll, I'll make a bit, uh, some more food. And she made up a huge plate of food, and it, was, it tasted really strange. It tasted really strange. But he was hungry, and he had it all up. And then they heard a commotion. It was it was all the devils coming back. She said, "Quick, hide under the bed, hide!" And he hid under the bed. He stayed there all night. And when the devils came in, they said, oh, <laughs> "We smell man, man smell, man smell. Bring, bring him, bring him, bring him. We want to eat him. We all want us. We'll have man for our supper." And Grandma said, "No, no, no, no. There was one here earlier, and he brought a sausage, but I sent him away." And you can smell that sausage. And they were satisfied, and she made them a huge plate of food. And they went to bed, and the next day. They went out collecting wood again because you don't you need to collect wood every day to keep those fires burning. And she got she pulled the, pulled him out from under the bed and said, "Here, I don't, you better not be here when they come back." But and she took a horsehair from the devil's mattress and said, "Put that on your shoulder, and don't look at it until you get home." Well, he walked and he walked. And it was light to start with, but it got heavier and heavier and heavier. When he got home, he threw it off his shoulder and instead of a horsehair, it was a golden staff, the size of a flag staff. Well, he took it and, well, I used to a little scrap dealing and you know, if you get good metal, you weigh it in and it's gold, you can't go better than gold. So he went to the goldsmith and he sold it to the goldsmith and he, he got so much money he was able to buy a food, buy, buy a farm and, and, uh, and some cattle and a flock of sheep and he never went back to work for Mihai again. But Mihai came to see him and said, well, well, well how, come, how come you've got all this? He told Mihai the story. I thought, well, you got that for one sausage. I'll 
take a string of sausages. And he went down, and there was the devil's grandmother. I've come for you, I've, I've come for the devil, said, said Leah. Come to see, see your grandson, said Mihai. I've brought him a string of sausages. Well, he's not here, said the devil's grandmother, but you can give me the sausages coming. That's not, all right, okay. Sure, I wanted to see anyway. And they came down and he waited. And they sat in silence. He wasn't, you know, I mean, he wasn't the sort of person that could talk to old women. He couldn't really talk to anyone. He was mean. And in the end, he looked at the, uh, he looked at the Grenville's grandmother and said, look, he said, I don't like you. You don't like me. We have, there's no point in us sitting in each other's company. Just give me a hair to put on my shoulder and I'll be off. And Devil's grandmother said, to tell you the truth, you're not good company, but I, and she took a hair from the pe devil's pillow and she put it on his shoulder, don't take it off till you get home. Of course I won't, he said, and he went home and it got heavier. It got heavier and heavier and heavier. And when he got home, he tossed it over his shoulder. And instead of a golden flagpole, it was a huge pair of bellows. And the bellows started blowing, started blowing, and they were blowing, and they blowing, and they blew his cattle in the air, and they blew his sheep in the air, and they blew his, his, his farmhouse, and, and, and they blew his barns in the air, and they came down and crashed and broke everywhere. And in the end, it blew him in the air, and he came down, and he was all bruised, and he was bleeding. He said, look, all my bones are breaking. And Yoshka just took him in his arms and said, there's nothing broken, but you are a bit bruised. And you are bleeding a bit. And he cleaned him up. And he was that kind. He went and rounded up all his cattle and his sheep. And he gave me high enough money to build a new farmhouse. But do you think Mihai was grateful? No. For the rest of his life, he blamed him for his bad luck. Because there's some people that are never satisfied. Right now, we have to be satisfied with what little we've got and what little space we've got. But it will all come to an end. One day we'll be able to travel again. And one day I'll be able to go and meet you all and I'll be able to go to Transylvania. And I can go back to Ireland. And if I'm, if I'm very lucky, I can go back and have another look at Vancouver Island. But for now, I'm happy just telling stories to you. And I'm even happier that you're listening to them. And if you like them, and if you want, and if you've got a little to spare, there's a hat below. You could just drop a little into the hat. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Stay safe. Well, that was another wonderful contribution to World Storytelling Cafe. Now, all the storytellers who've been sharing their work are not earning any money at the moment, but there's a way in which we can help them. If you'd like to contribute, and if you'd like to put a few coins into the hat, this is from Mongolia. And what have I got here? I've got a Mongolian coin. If you'd like to put a coin in from Mongolia, or Hungary, or Jordan, or what else have I got? Or from the UK, if you're feeling generous, you can put a note in. Or some Argentine pesos or some euros. Whatever you put in, large or small, will go directly to helping all the storytellers and enabling more stories to come onto World Storytelling Cafe. If you go to the website of the same name, www.worldstorytellingcafe and all the storytellers will be ever grateful. Bye.